share the screen with my um, with the um, let me see. Hold on a second. Share the screen. Uh, everybody can see the screen. Yep. I'm probably I'm probably yeah, leaking yeah. a lot of information, but you know, I basically don't care. Um, so the first order of business is uh, the antitrust policy and the code of conduct. Antitrust policy. Uh, the Linux Foundation wants us to be aware that we could be competitors, uh, but no collusion on price, no anti-competitive behavior. That is the only requirement you have to join the call. The other uh, item here is the um, code of conduct, which, which says, that we treat each other with respect and civility even when we are disagreeing with people and that can happen obviously but when we are uh, um, when we disagree we do it in a respectful way these are the only two requirements to join the call now we can go through introductions um, there are 10 participants and some of whom seem to be new. So, uh, so again, the introductions are going to, should be very short, like 10, 15 seconds at the most. And uh, if you do not want to introduce yourself, that's also fine, but the introduction should consist of what you're working on, why you are here, and what can you contribute or what are you going to take away from this? So I start with Tony Bellin. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm fairly, uh, uh, I'm joining uh, because I'd like to learn, learn more about Hyperledger uh, Fabric in particular. Um, and I've, Gotten my a little bit of my chops up on um, Python, but I know a lot of things are written on Go, and I'm just looking to learn as much as I can about the Fabric process. Um, and I don't know if, where, or if I can contribute, but that's something I'll be looking forward to do at some point. So, so before we go any further, let's be very clear about what this group is. It's an identity working group on Hyperledger. Obviously, we deal with uh, many of the uh, Hyperledger uh, frameworks, including Fabric, but normally we do not go into details on technical uh, stuff. Okay. Uh, there are there are many other uh, meetups or or, or uh, meetings, and other working groups, channels, and so on, which are dedicated solely to Fabric. And I see. Uh, okay. And uh, you can uh, join them too. But uh, in case you are interested in identity, which is of course a foundational topic in blockchains, because without identity, there is nothing else. Uh, right. Uh, so that's that's our focus. So okay. Just let uh, to set the uh, levels, set the uh, expectations that you might have. So mostly, uh, this is uh, this is. Uh, People who are either working directly on the identity uh, identity space, or we are discussing things that are happening and are hot topics in identity, and then we tie it back to blockchain to see whether these uh, laws, regulations. Today's focus will be on uh, data protection regulations. So, how are they going to impact us? Uh, that is one of the main uh, focus here um, and uh, our paper contains uh, links to 
things like fabric uh, implementation and identity uh, implementation and how fabric differs, let's say from Sawtooth or uh, there are pure identity solutions like Indy uh, in, in, our, uh, in our frameworks. And then, uh, you know, we have the Ethereum variants, um, Besu and Burrow. So we talk about a lot of different, uh, different ways of handling identity. Uh, but most of them uh, ultimately uh, are, you know, related to, let's say, uh, asymmetric uh, cryptography. Anyway, go, uh, going uh, right along, the next uh, person is Alfonso Govela. Um, thank you, BP. I'm Alfonso Govela from Medida, Mexico. Um, I'm a consultant for urban innovation and blockchain at Metropolis, which is a league of major cities. Uh, we founded Blockchain Medida and Hyperledger Medida meetup groups. And my interest is to learn more about the resource of identity to use it in public, um, public sector and social impact. Thank you. Great. So you probably will be very interested in IoT, uh, identity, delegation, and so on, which are uh, going to be the topics uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, we, we want to focus on those um, in the coming weeks. And then uh, we have Ankita. Ankita. Uh, yeah, hi. Thanks, Vipin. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Ankita working on identity solution uh, with uh, ironworks technologies and uh, I'm, we are using hyperledger areas of course and nd stack and i'm looking forward to explore more uh, uh, in this space and uh, integrating uh, this identity you keep uh, dropping out anyway um Hello, am I audible? Yes, but you keep dropping off maybe because you're pressing the mute button. Oh, oh, I guess, oh, yeah. Is it okay? Uh, yes. Better? Yes. Really sorry. Don't okay. worry about it. So, uh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, I'm working with Ironworks Technologies and uh, mainly working on identity solution using ARIS and uh, Hyperledger ND stack. And looking forward to explore more on the data protection and uh, uh, the other use cases. Dan. Thank you. Is that Dan Bakkenham or you? Do you want me to sign you? Yeah, just, just a short introduction. Yep. If you, yep. you know, we, I know yep. who you are, but not the others. Yep. Yep, yeah, so Dan Bach and I'm here. I'm with Accenture uh, Digital Identity Team. Uh, the highlight for me today is I'm, uh, I'm in Davos, Switzerland at the World Economic Forum. We just uh, did a briefing on uh, known travel with digital identity, which is a decentralized identity scheme using Piper Ledger uh, Indy. And um, yeah, that's my 15 seconds. Uh, maybe you could um, uh, tell us in the coming weeks what happened at Davos with respect to identity. I have a feeling that uh, maybe even Ruben is in Davos or somebody else is in Davos. You know, everybody who's anybody is in Davos, but you know, we are, we are not there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, happy to report out. Um, I, I know Brian Bellendorf is here. I've uh, uh, been in a couple of meetings with him. Uh, you're head of the Hyperledger Foundation. But yeah, happy to uh, talk to you offline about scheduling some time yep great um john i am uh, john callahan i go by jack i'm the cto of viridium uh, and i know many of the people on the call uh, uh dan wonderful that you're dialing in from uh, from davos there that's fantastic <laughs> so uh thanks for taking the time 
And uh, Kalyan from uh, Iron Works, another sovereign steward. We're a sovereign founding steward uh, uh, as well. And I haven't joined this call before, but the topics, particularly on biometrics, uh, have uh, hit my radar screen and I'm delighted to participate. Thank you. So Dan is the expert on biometrics and hopefully uh, he will make a, a presentation on that uh, particular topic with respect to ISO uh, variations. Um, I think it's 307 on biometrics and the link to uh, some of the NIST, uh, uh, NIST guidance on identity proofing and so on. Um, yeah, I, I agree, Vipin, and uh, I forgot to mention that uh, I'm also the author on the, uh, 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 Kalyan knows this, on the uh, Hyperledger Aries uh, Biometric Service Provider uh, yep. protocol spec. Yeah. Great. Yep. So we have uh, at least a few experts on biometrics here. Um, now let's go down the list and get it, uh, uh, Kalyan. Yeah, thanks, Vipin. This is Kalyan. I am the CEO for Ironworks. Um, we have been focused uh, on identity space from last two years now, and uh, being uh, no, working really uh, on the on the the Aries stack as well. We are also contributing to the uh, frameworks, as Jack rightly mentioned. We are we are uh, kind of collaborating with this group, and uh, lots of changes happening, which are positive in terms of the identity getting more and more highlights and importance with the various uh, rules and acts coming out. So looking forward to knowing more about these, yeah. Thank you, thanks, Vipin. Uh, Paolo, I'm not calling on you, Kelly, because you normally, when you're taking notes, uh, you do not okay. want to. Okay, I'm Paolo Campeggiani from Italy. Uh, I work for Bitfreddy, which is a digital identity provider. But here I'm especially because also it happens that I am the project leader for the new technical report on the existing DLT system for identity management that the working group two of the ISO TC 307 standardization committee is tasked to do this year. Beautiful. So uh, I'm, interested, I'm interested to understand what's the current status of India and especially how things are progressing. Yeah, I mean, they have indie, indie implementation. Uh, I mean, we have the identity working group implementation calls on Thursday that may be more, uh, you know, they have much more detail on the uh, actual implementations, including indie Aries, and so on. So that, that might be a good call to join for you. Okay, thanks. Thanks no for problem. pointing this out. Yeah, but you can, you can, uh, you know, hopefully you will find us interesting enough and you will, uh, you know, you can contribute uh, in a generic sense to the general direction. Uh, Roland? Uh, hi, yes. Uh, yeah, I'm Ruben. I work uh, on identity stuff since four years. I work at Consensus. I have, uh, I'm one of the people who started Uport, which is one of the stuff on identity uh, tools out there. I also lead the EA, so the Ethereum Enterprise Alliance uh, Identity Working Group. So I'm here mainly to see where we can work together. And like, I think there's a bunch of stuff which is actually very um, interrelated and not specific to any chain anyway. Um, and I'm um, the ED for the Decent Identity Foundation, which is more of an industry effort to line our work towards standards um, on building yeah, decent identity systems um, across blockchains, across technologies and so on. Um, and so Ruben is a, a rock star here because he's the leader of identity um, stuff. <laughs> stuff is. <laughs> yeah, stuff, meaning you port, DIF, EEA, and so on. Uh, and uh, lately I've been given a observer status in EEA, so I hope to join the identity working group calls as well. Sure. And um, Ruben, 
is also uh, proposed something along the lines of uh, you know the personal data stores uh, you know the, 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 the there was a cross collaboration meeting between the various uh, parties that was basically to talk about uh, data stores that are under the control of the subject and uh, you know they are called different things in different uh, different frameworks but uh, they are all similar they converge to a similar set of problems and we had sent out a note about that uh, about their meetings uh, and Ruben is uh, in the process of uh, creating a DIF based working group to collaborate on this I think yes the idea is, I think there are different communities, as I mentioned, within Hyperledger, uh, within Diff, as well as within W3C. Um, so the idea is to um, create the working group within Diff because we have um, all the legal frameworks in place to then transfer the work once it becomes more formalized uh, into Diff or ITF or other places. So the Diff is more like the earlier stage uh, place where we want to very engineering driven develop um, standards or emerging specs whilst WCC and ITF are places where it's really great to then mature these and like make this as global standards so that's kind of how we want to collaborate together and we are working on the proposal how the collaboration could look like in specific on this topic between WCC and DIFF so that's work in progress. Yes and um since DIF is a member organization, this I assume will be a member only sort of situation or is it going to be more open to people like us who do not have memberships? Yeah, it's likely to be as open as we did with DITCOM. So DITCOM is another initiative which um, actually incubated within the ARIS, uh, Hyperledger ARIS um, community. Um, it's about the secure messaging between DIDs, between identities uh, in the centralized space. And we just launched the working group in the beginning of the year within DIFF, have members from Hyperledger areas as well as DIFF uh, working on this together. And here as well, we allow uh, individuals to join. And for companies, we made it also easier. We're still like defining the model for going, for, like, going forward. but. It was one of the requirements for the storage topic to be as well open for collaboration. There's only one limitation we just need to put in place is people need to sign certain IP. Uh, yes, documents to make sure that all contributions are without any like patent claims or any other things because we want to make sure that it can be used uh, without any restrictions across the ecosystem. Yeah, this is a hot topic even here in Hyperledger because uh, we use a DCO sign off. Um, um, but then it doesn't tie back to a real identity sometimes. Uh, and, you know, there's all, all, all kinds of uh, legal issues related to that. Uh, so as you can see, that is related to identity. And how can you prove that you are authorized to sign off on a piece of code, especially if you haven't authored it yourself. Uh, you might have copied it from somewhere, you might have uh, taken some material from somewhere else, you know, that kind of stuff. So this, this is a, a very interesting topic for us. Um, I only see one more person who didn't, uh, who didn't, um, That was uh, Roland Erosuete, uh, and uh, there was another person, Rohit. So uh, please, Roland, go ahead, and then after that, Rohit. I guess uh, uh, Roland is silent, so I think uh, Rohit, you should go ahead if you can get yourself off mute. Hello, uh, this is Rohit and uh, I'm working with the Ironworks as a blockchain developer. And I'm working on a Hyperledger ID. 
Thank you. Um, so I think without further, you know, going around and beating around the bush, uh, people always ask me, why do you spend so much time in introductions? Why? Because it really brings out what people are working on. And uh, like, for example, we had a mini discussion with Ruben, for example, on this, uh, you know, on the topic of uh, collaboration on DIDCOM and uh, personal data stores or whatever you want to call them, hubs. Uh, anyway, so this is the main motivation behind going into uh, slightly elaborate introductions. Um, now, this brings us to uh, the purpose and the motive behind Identity Working Group. And so I'm going to go into a little bit here for the roadmap. Uh, and I can show you that uh, the roadmap that we have, uh, you know, I shared some of it last week. Uh, basically, I mean, can it, everybody see this? Hello? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, so, obviously, to build a community, which is what we are doing with the introductions and so on and so forth, and the work products, there is a white paper uh, being worked on, but it's been worked on for years because the topic seems to go on endlessly. There isn't uh, collaboration within a couple of, you know, it's, it's very difficult to get something like this uh, done unless you have dedicated personnel and we are all volunteers. And the other uh, aspect is presentations. And then we can align using mailing list, Zoom, Rocket Chat, Wiki, and conferences where it, which, which, which are uh, either a mix of asynchronous methods, meaning you don't have to be on a call, all everybody at the same time, you can actually uh, collaborate. Uh, and also getting the knowledge from different groups into Hyperledger, like we just talked about the W3C uh, and the grid working group, which is a members only thing, and TIFF and IIW, re rebooting Web of Trust, uh, the ISO 307 work uh, that Dan and uh, the other gentleman, Paolo, are doing. Uh, all of this helps us to focus on identity, uh, you know, the concerns around identity that are happening everywhere else. So I had put in a brief timeline, but, you know, basically, uh, this is just a suggestion. Anybody has any, any particular suggestion, they can put it there. Uh, we are collaborating with the supply chain SIG to make a presentation on SSI and supply chain use cases. Uh, I hope uh, it is going to be John Jordan and or Drummond who is going to come and uh, talk about this. And the presentations are going to be, we have already had a presentation on the California Customer Privacy Act. Uh, then today we are going to talk about uh, data protection regulations all around the world and also in the United States. Uh, the state of identity, which I call it because uh, Kim Cameron is the elder statesman on this topic and he'll be presenting on February 5th. I call the state of identity because he's got a very comprehensive view of what's going on everywhere. Uh, this week he's in Japan, so uh, he couldn't join us, but he's going to be listening to the recording. Then we're going to go to the IoT topic, uh, the identity of IoTs, which we briefly touched upon with uh, with respect to the uh, state, uh, you know, to the city, smart city kind of initiatives that uh, the gentleman, uh, Paolo was, uh, or, or no, not Paolo, the guy from Merida uh, was talking about. Uh, then we also going to do something on guardianship with respect to the uh, 
sovereign paper. There are several experts here. Kelly was participating in that, and so was uh, so is Drummond. I, I think Drummond is busy today, so that's why he's not on the call. And I have sketched out some tentative presentations uh, for the rest of the year. I am happy to take any uh, any sort of suggestions. I also created the uh, identity working group, uh, the TSC report, which is on, uh, on the link. And if you guys, which is here, uh, and if you guys want to make any suggestions on that, that would be great because we are supposed to every quarter submit a report to the uh, technical steering committee. Um, it's turned into a little bit of a box ticking exercise, but uh you know that's where we are uh, now ravi kant was supposed to talk about the uh, personal data protection laws that were recently launched in india uh, and my aim uh, and and he said he couldn't make it so i am going to talk about uh, the privacy laws across the world with an aside on the state laws of the United States, right? I've collected a, a bunch of material here uh, and I have it here. It's, somebody's uh, putting up stuff on uh, chat, looks like, uh, let me see what, what they're saying. Okay. Ruben is uh, gone, so that's that's that. Now I'm going to go to the top of the um, and do a presentation, right? Uh, you can see my screen, though, right? I hope. Yep. So yeah. So I'm going to talk about the state of uh, data protection regulations around the world. And the aim in talking about all this is because we can extract uh, some kind of patterns, pattern in, in, in the regulation, and then see how we can adopt uh, the implementation in a blockchain to come up with ways to deal with this. There are some challenges, and I think uh, some of the main challenges uh, we'll talk about when we talk about the actual laws. Um, so why is this a problem today? Because there were no data protection regulations, really nothing. And that caused um, basically people to do whatever the hell they wanted. The enterprises uh, sucked up all the data and they monetized it. Surveillance capitalism became a big thing. And uh, people found out soon enough that the emergent effects of this sort of behavior uh, led to all kinds of uh, bad effects including, uh, you know, subversion of democracy, uh, you know, which is the biggest, uh, biggest effect so, so far, but it could include uh, things like, uh, you know, social credit scoring, uh, various other ways in which this, this is, uh, this, unregulated state of affairs has led to a complete you know destruction of privacy and then of course there were a lot of people who came uh, i mean actually there were a couple of people especially in the um, in europe who uh, started a campaign against this sort of unregulated data collection. 
And that has led us to this, uh, this particular situation because the regulation was written by legislators, mostly lawyers, mostly you know people uh, who have very little um, exposure to true technology. So obviously these regulations are meant to be technology neutral but unfortunately that has uh, that has resulted in uh, overreach you know this is this is the usual pattern there is uh, no regulation there is abuse then there is the regulatory pendulum swings the other way and both of these uh, extremes are bad for us but this is what has led led us to this uh, situation and some of the laws um, are similar to uh, you know basically the data not leaving the country for example data localization laws uh, which are uh, which can be tantamount to saying you know even people cannot leave the country so what happens if uh, somebody uh, commits a crime and then flees to another country. There are extradition laws that uh, between countries sometimes uh, that uh, allow for that situation to be rectified. Maybe there should be data uh, extradition laws. I don't. I don't know. I mean, but nobody talks about this. No, no, none of the data protection regulations talk about this because they just want to keep the data in the in the country so that they have complete control over it uh, they do not have to ask some other country to say what is the data about my citizens that are residing in your country and this is obviously happening also because of uh, things like the cloud things like what's happening you know all over the place so so this state of affairs has resulted in uh, more and more countries adopting uh, comprehensive data protection or privacy laws. Uh, so there is somebody who tracks this, and I will show you in the next slide what, what that is. Uh, 130 countries have adopted this, and 40 more countries and uh, have uh, pending bills. Um, so what do they cover? Personal information held in both electronic and physical form uh, and to all or nearly all subject areas, which means like uh, both private uh, companies as well as government collection of data. Uh, and all of them have, most of them have proposed uh, independent data protection or independent uh, information commission uh, that is nationwide along with uh, requirements for companies to have data protection officers. Uh, there are exemptions to this law, which include um, national right to information uh, and other uh, legal, uh, you know, legal sort of pathways to uh, to retain the data, uh, even. Uh, after the uh, customer says they do not want the data retained. Now, I've been talking uh, quite a bit, so I want to hear from you guys what, you know, if this is useful or not, what is, what should we be talking about? Uh, I'll go to the next slide, which gives a, a sort of a overview. So I'm um, in the meantime, I would love to hear more from uh, people on the call about the data protection and privacy laws that are happening in their own country and others. I guess it's, uh... go ahead. Somebody wants to say something, they can 
go ahead and say. Well, hey, uh, Vivian. Um, so I'm a United States citizen, and I know that uh, a lot of the discussion around this sort of area got spark sparked with the GDPR, the European Union's GDPR, and California, in particular, with the CCPA, did something similar to, but not quite the same as um, the GDPR. And it's just really learning the differences um, between the two scopes. And I know, you know, those aren't necessarily the, the models to, to follow, but since they've already been established, it's like, well, that's kind of what has been established already. So we'll kind of work off of that. That's my understanding um, of, you know, you know, data rights, identity, and how it, how it all kind of plays in using those as kind of benchmarks to go off of. Yeah, so if you look at this particular uh, uh, map, it shows that the US, no initiatives or no information. Why? Because the lack of a federal law for privacy, right? That's why, that's why US and Alaska are shown in white. White. These two areas. Now, we also have a white in China, but I know that China wants to, or has already a uh, privacy law. And nobody knows what that privacy law is. Uh, I will try to look at the uh, translations of that privacy law. So you have in China, for example, you have this schizophrenia, right? You have on the one hand, people wanting to protect the privacy. On the other hand, there is mass surveillance. Uh, there is, uh, you know, credit, uh, social credit scoring. Uh, there is cameras everywhere. Now they can recognize people. They can uh, do all kinds of things. They can also the physical location uh, uh, you know, your physical location is no longer private. Uh, so all of this stuff is happening. Uh, but in terms of the U.S., I'm going to go into the state, wa state uh, by state comparison. And we did have a, a presentation on CCPA hmm. here uh, last week. And you can see the CCPA uh, slides with the... Uh, differences uh, between GDPR and CCPA. They may not be as uh, well laid out, but that's the beginning and we want to put in uh, those differences. So what happens if you're developing a global blockchain platform with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, you know, collaborators scattered across the globe? What how do you implement cross jurisdictional or you know jurisdictional uh, specific to specific jurisdictions how do you implement these protections uh, you know these are all so, go ahead yes yeah, so, but what's the scope of this conversation because now you invoke blockchain so the answer to your question could be as simple as don't put any private information on the blockchain, including sure. private private DINs. So it's really important to understand what the scope of the conversation is. Well, um, the, right. Yeah. So we had in in our um, in our write up on the identity working group, we have said that PII is not to be put on the blockchain, right? Uh, and how do you segregate that? into a uh, into a data store that is localized first of all second that can um, be accessed by whoever is authorized to access it uh, that's the second thing the third is it is not just the PII that is uh, protected it's the uh, transaction information it is metadata so if we go into the um, 
uh, you know, next next slide. We're going to go into the uh, privacy uh, law comparisons for state uh, comprehensive. Uh, you know, I, I I understand your question, which is why you know this is a very wide scope topic, and uh, why are we uh, you know where do we draw the line? Don't we have to uh, talk about something very concrete with respect to hyperledger technologies? rather than talking about uh, you know data protection and privacy laws uh, across the world or across uh, all the states of the United States is, is that yeah yeah you're getting it like you said there's no federal uh, privacy laws in the US but there are uh, every uh, federal entity has to do privacy impact assessments and uh, and have system of record notices, but it has absolutely nothing to do with blockchain. It certainly has everything to do with personal data, but again, it's what it was the scope of the conversation. If it's around distributed ledger technologies, the way you have privacy protection and the way you comply with GDPR is you don't put any PII on chain, including private bids. Yeah, sure. Um, but what happens? Uh, what happens if you uh, put transactions on the blockchain and somehow somebody can link uh, your um, your identity to those transactions that you conducted? Right. Well, it, then then it's a poor design. But that's that's the discussion then. Then the, the, the scope of the discussion in distributed ledger technology is if you're going to audit transactions on the ledger, um, have transaction IDs that, um, that, that either you know, cannot be or uh, pseudonymously uh, linked to an identity. And in terms of metadata, uh, as GDPR states, you, any, uh, uh, any information that can be used to uniquely identify an, uh, an individual's personally identifiable information. So if that, uh, if that identity, uh, if that metadata can be used to personally identify an individual, A, it shouldn't be on the, <laughs> on the ledger, uh, and, and B, if it is, you're just not following best practices. Okay, so the ledger becomes a uh, repository of pure proofs and hashes, right? Uh, with that view. <laughs> Well, proofs, yes. Now, hashes becomes, this is still, last I checked, uh, uh, what is it, Work Group 29 in the EU for GDPR, uh, they're saying probably that uh, hashes of data is, is still PII. Um, certainly encrypted data should not be put on chain. Hashes, it's arguable, even with salted hashes, um, uh, you know, mathematicians may say that's, you know, almost impossible. Uh, to reverse engineer, um, I think the privacy lawyers are, are you know, still debating it. But um, uh, so Accenture's policy, to whatever that's worth, is because there's a gray area, don't even do it. Don't put even hashes of PII on chain. Okay, so how do you, you know, so you have other systems uh, that will do the identity proofing, uh, PII storage and so on and so forth, and of course that those have to follow all of the uh, all of the right. Those are th those are identity management systems which are covered under ISO SE 37, uh, 27, not uh, ISO SE 307, you know, TC 307. Yeah. You know, so SE 27 being security and identity management systems. All right. Uh, so are they are they currently safe? <laughs> well, with all the hacks in the news and breaches in the news, I would, I would have to say no. But, but that's probably due to either insider threats or poor implementation, right? But again, it's not a, a DLT thing unless you scope it into the discussion. Well, I mean, the whole point is that we are talking about DLT being a... Uh, system of record for transactions somehow, I mean, you know, whether it's directly accessible, which is obviously a bad idea, uh, or somehow, 
hidden, uh, you know, like like for example, in Corda, you know, they, it's a bilateral system. So obviously the transactions are visible to the counterparties who are on the uh, who are on the transaction, but not to anyone else. Now, how do you then remove the, you know, if, if there is a, a right of erasure, then how do you remove that stuff? Uh, these are all, hmm. you know, this will have a direct impact on the uh, adoption of distributed ledgers. Right. So you're absolutely right. So then I think the answer to the question is, is what we want to focus on is what's written to the ledger, including transaction audits, and what should those transaction audits uh, can be comprised of and and if there's PII you know and you know what about associating transactions to PII and and um, uh, yeah and I know there's been some discussions in India like your example with Corda they're all when it's uh, done correctly let's say uh, implemented based on best practices uh, again there's there's uh, pairwise pseudonymous channels between the, um, the the service requester and the service provider, and th those two only those two know the relationship. Similar to to FIDO, once that channel is established, uh, just like FIDO, you could have a different bid for every interaction with that service provider, so they don't know it's the same person because it's a private bid. You could have thousands of private bids. For one service provider, and that's how uh, that's where I thought the discussion was going to be about how do you have privacy protection on the ledger? Well, you use private DIDs and don't use the same private DID even within a service provider. Yeah, I mean, that is a uh, proposal from Indy, uh, but in the end, if you have a verifier you have to expose data to the verifier and the verifier has a right to copy that data, right, in a, in a way. I mean, they, first, of all, first of all, they have to know, you, you're going to have a verifier who's just a service provider for some service and you're, you're right that, that you can delink the issuer from the uh, verifier, fine, using these techniques. Now, and on the ledger will be, you know, whatever is available to, uh, to make that, uh, the pairwise did conversation much more private. But in the end, that service provider is, is capturing your data. Uh, right. And, and associating it with a person because they're providing you a service. You're going to a doctor the doctor yeah. knows who you are. I mean, you know, you cannot escape yeah. that, right? No, definitely, definitely. But that's where, you know, so if there was, let's say a bank or whatever doctor, using your example, is a service provider, which, uh, you know, where if the scope of our conversation is how do you protect crack on chain, you know, in the DLT, um, and how do you, uh, you know, ensure that um, privacy and security, that's one thing. Now, as soon as I give through a pairwise pseudonymous or that, connection you talked about in Corda, as soon as I then with uh, informed consent share my information with the service provider, boom, then, then we're off chain. We're now in a different domain. But that's any identity management domain. You know, that's that's which what is, I'm trying to say. The, the, right. Which which has been shown to be rife with problems. Uh, which has been shown right. to have to to leak uh, lots and lots of information. Uh, in fact, some of the greatest breaches have been because of that. Uh, but anyway, we will try to link it back to blockchain in, in this way that, you know, that we have these patterns, which is what I'm going to go to in the next couple of slides, right? This is the privacy law comparison with the different, for the different uh, uh, states. Uh, and as you can see, California, Nevada, and Maine have uh, signed uh, privacy law uh, laws that are 
that are similar in many ways to GDPR. Uh, and then what do the law say? You know, there's personal data, critical transaction and metadata, and they all have different levels of, uh, you know, supposedly different levels of uh, obfuscation or protection. Uh, then, you know, you have the data localization, data breach, notification, erasure, and all these rights, uh, which I'll go into the next slide uh, where there are two particular things that we talk about. One is the consumer rights. Um, it, consumers have a access, right to access to the collected data, to the shared data, to rectification, to deletion, to restriction, to portability, and all this stuff. But not all the laws have the same views on every one of these topics. In fact, there is a comparison here, which shows you in, in, in terms of state laws, I am sure you can find the same comparison between the sovereign laws uh, passed across the world, the same uh, sort of difference in the protection. Like in the California case, for example, uh, you can opt out and you're opted in by, um, by default. Default. Yeah. Um, then again, you know, the intersection of AI and consumer data, which is fully automated, solely automated decision making. California does not have protections for that. Some other state, like Massachusetts, seems to have, like right here. Sorry. You know, so there are certain. Uh, headings, you know, if you go back to the DPR, this consumer rights and then business obligations. All of them are present in one form or the other in the, in the laws, but some laws do not protect specific, uh, you know, specific items. So what do we do as implementers? Uh, so we can either punt it completely onto the other side and say, you know, it's all going to be implemented in uh, identity and access management systems. And we only function as the glue to this. Uh, so each of these, like for example, if the customer wants to access to collected data and they ask for it, that probably can be put, to, put as a proof in the blockchain saying like, you know, somebody did ask this data to be collected uh, to, to get access to the collected data or to the shared data, or, you know, they wanted to do rectification or they did opt out. I mean, how do you put that in there? Or how do you put that in a shared ledger so that we can access it in some off-chain system properly and with guaranteed privacy. Obviously, there have been lots of, uh, uh, you know, lots of recommendations using cryptography, multi-party computation, zero knowledge proofs. You know, there's a whole plethora of these things. So I think what we have to do is Go into each one, you know, yes, you, we have to, uh, like Dan says, we have to talk about what is stored in the, in the ledger, what is not stored in the ledger. What, I mean, why do we even need a ledger, for example? You know, if you don't store anything there, if you don't store the links, if you don't store anything there, then what good is a ledger? The accumulator and transaction audits. To do a accumulation? Uh, right, the accumulator keeps track of valid verifiable credentials and revoked uh, verifiable credentials. Yes. Yeah, so we'll have a presentation on um, 
this, uh, you know, we have had several presentations on SSI uh, and DIDs and all that. And I think we have uh, come to a point where uh, that those technologies have grown quite a bit. Uh, and the thought around those technologies have grown quite a bit so that we need uh, the latest state of, uh, you know, this of uh, DIDs and SSI technology, including Indian ARIES and uh, other associated uh, techniques. Anyway, we have come to the end of uh, today's meeting. And hopefully we can come up with uh, more data, I mean, more uh, ways in which we can leapfrog from this, this uh, regulations into implement it, you know, what are the, what are the recommendations? How do you look at the system uh, implemented using DLTs and say that it's safe? Uh, that, and how, how can we then also relate to what we have in Hyperledger? So with that, I think uh, we come to the end of the meeting. Uh, let me know any other thoughts that you might have before we close, or we can uh, actually uh, collaborate on the rocket chat or mailing list. Please put any of your uh, thoughts about this and how we in the identity working group can collaborate and make things better. Pretty informative discussion today we had with Vinya. All right, thank you. Um, and uh, good luck, uh, Dan. And you know, hopefully you won't, you're not freezing in Davos. Thanks, Pippin. Uh, very informative. I'll, I'll be on the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 See you next time. Bye. Bye.